Coulomb law of attraction of opposites and repulsion of likes has no relationship whatsoever to natural law. Nature does not attract, nor does it repel. Pairs of opposites in nature are projected centripetally towards each other by the light mirrors of wave field projectors of light images. Suffice it here to say that all mates which are approaching each other for union are electrically forced to approach each other from the outside. They are not attracted together from the inside. They cannot help being forced. They are being wound up together electrically in spiral vortices. They must inevitably collide and become one even as a threaded screw is forced to interpenetrate an oppositely threaded nut. The fact that they spin in the same mutual direction allows them to mate and this creates the illusion to our senses of so-called attraction. The magnetic light is sexless or it is in equilibrium. Its electric division into pairs creates the dual sex condition, which we know as male and female. When these two conditions unite, they become one. Gravity poles are two when divided by the electric current. When they unite, they become one center of gravity. We have always called them magnetic poles when they were two, but when those two were united, we have called them a center of gravity, and that is not consistent. The gravity poles are still centers which balance and control the electric motion which surrounds them. Electric motion can be insulated from all other electric motion, but so-called magnetic polarity, which is in reality gravity polarity, or the gravity center where poles unite as one, cannot be insulated from anything, for they are of the omnipresent stillness upon which the universe of motion is based, the Creator's omnipresent still magnetic light. Gravity and magnetism are both attributes of the Creator's still magnetic light universe. Gravity is points and shafts of still magnetic light. The magnetic control of all electric motions are cathode planes of still magnetic light, which are omnipresent. Electricity, therefore, produced the gravity poles by compressing the holes out of the rings. They did not come here in any other way. Electric motion does not create gravity poles. It merely locates existent points and makes them identifiable. It makes the invisible become seemingly visible. However, it never occurred to the early observers that the division of God's stillness into sex pairs would have to have a measure of balanced control over such a division. In other words, if the one condition of balanced stillness in the zero universe is divided into two unbalanced conditions, it is then necessary to have two controlling points of stillness, poles around which motion can spin while thus divided. The two poles are therefore gravity poles of still magnetic light, around which the divided electric pairs can manifest their lights of motion. The two sexed gravity poles, thus divided, have within them the desire to be united as one, by uniting the two sex divided pairs of conditions as one. In this manner, the two poles which have united become the common center of gravity of the whole gravity shaft of the mass controlled by it. Neither polarity nor gravity are created by electricity. They merely become points which can be located in the omnipresent stillness. When, therefore, we say that electricity creates the condition of gravity, we mean that electric motion is spinning around a point in the omnipresent vacuum, which controls that motion from within, while magnetic planes of still light control the motions from without. Polarity begins as sexless unity at the cathode planes of still magnetic light, which is the location for the inert gases in the octaves of elements. From there, it is divided into sex condition pairs as they are extended centripetally toward anodes. They again unite as one sexless unity at amplitude wave positions where they collide and become the two hemispheres of an incandescent 
microscopic or macrocosmic sun. When a series of gravity bars is placed in this order, you cannot take one of the gravity bars out of this order and reverse its ends, as shown in B. If you do, you have two males and two females, where the normal mates of opposite sexes should be. This creates the illusion to our senses that there is a repulsion acting between them, when in fact the rings cannot mate due to their opposed directions of their spinning electric rings. Male electric rings spin in opposite direction of other male rings. Likewise, female rings spin in the opposite direction of other female electric rings, so they cannot combine their spinning motions. Male and female electric rings spin in the same direction of their opposed vortices, so they can mate, and their mating is not due to attraction or an attractive force, as previously explained. It is due to the mutual paths of their electric vortex rings. Electricity spins around all centers in this whole universe in one direction only. C represents this universal direction of electric spinning around the same series of gravity bars. That one direction is clockwise or anti-clockwise according to the position of the observer. If you look at the spiral turning from one end in the direction of the other end, you will see a clockwise spinning motion. If you look at it by reversing your position, you will see an anti-clockwise spinning motion. The direction of turning does not change because you change. This is an illusion created by our senses and the thinking which is based upon them. It is not well, however, to leave this mystery of how falsely defined magnetism picks up iron nails and steel needles unexplained. For the entire electrical engineering world is paying heavily for lack of this understanding in many ways. The more expensive one being the vast wastage caused by building improper coils, solenoids, armatures, step-up, step-down transformers, and electronic tubes. The element iron, like cobalt, is formed almost at the very amplitude of the wave. Its position is almost at the collision point where mates find unity in each other. Also, iron is on the red male side of the spectrum division, and the red side bores within the blue when they seek unity. Nickel and copper are on the blue female side of the same octave. Because of this position in the wave, iron and cobalt are so constructed under high compression and high melting points that they remember the motion of the electric coil which borned them, even after that coil is removed. The spinning effect still continues within them, and will still continue for many years unless they are heated to a sufficiently high temperature to explode the power of electric potential which these poles have accumulated. Conversely, coal multiplies that memory which heat destroys. At absolute zero, polarity and conductivity both are more intense. It should be sufficiently convincing that the so-called magnetism attributed to this electric effect could not be an existent force or if it were, it could not be destroyed by heat. Factually, cold multiplies electric potential and heat divides it. This is proved conclusively by modern lab experiments in superconductivity. This fact of nature should bring to an end this unnatural concept which attributes electrical effects to something other than electricity and falsely labeling it magnetism or magnetic force, neither of which even exists. Electricity is the sole force of our electric universe. Copper and nickel occupy the same relation on the blue side of their octave that iron and cobalt occupy on the red side. Yet neither of them are able to retain the memory of the electric coil which born them. The reason for that is because the blue female side seeks the outside of mass and therefore has lower density, with consequent less power to retain a memory of the motion. Regarding the compass needle, which seeks the point of north at one end and the point of south at the other end, the principle is the same. Every compass needle is a miniature gravity bar. If you place a lot of iron filings on paper in the familiar way shown in all textbooks and shake them over a magnet, those filings will form curved lines. These curved lines 
are defined by academia as magnetic lines of force on that paper and magnetic fields when describing heavenly bodies. They are not magnetic lines of force or magnetic fields. They are merely the curved planes of opposing pressures which electricity is causing in its effort to compress. The vortex of gravity which is in the compass needle will follow these pressures. Every effect of motion in this universe is an electrical effect caused by an electrical force acting under the control of the invisible magnetic universe. The invisible magnetic universe entirely dominates and controls the visible electric universe, but all motion is entirely electric. Mankind wrongly winds the coils he uses to pump electricity, like the cylindrical coil on the left in this image. He then compresses it around wires which he uses to transmit it from one location to another. These coils work according to the man-made laws of thermodynamics and lose force over distance due to resistance and heat entropy. Nature, however, winds her optical electric coils in spiraling vortex cones. There are four steps up where the force is increased by the square each step up, thereby multiplying the original force. For example, in terms of heat from 8 degrees to 64 and finally to 4096 degrees, due to the increased centripetal motion and the resistance as the waves are compressed into tighter and tighter spirals. Therefore, in order to reap the abundance of nature, Mankind must copy the Creator's spiraling optical coils of electrically simulated light by building wire coils which are based on the Creator's spiraling vortices and not mankind's wire-wrapped cylinders. Walter and Leo Russell constructed an over-unity free energy machine which they called the optical dynamo with the help of Raytheon and NORAD in 1961. The coils were built into vortex cones which used nature's multiplication process by the square of force as mentioned earlier to produce an enormous amount of heat from a very small amount of electricity and were able to drive a steam turbine with this heat to create exponentially more electricity than was used to heat the water to steam and drive the turbine generator.